Welcome to the Dare Podcast. This is a successful mindset podcast, and I am your host, Miranda Braun. I'm so excited to bring you the latest tips, advice, and wisdom on how to create a successful mindset to manifest your goals in life and create abundance in health, wealth, and love. Tune in every month and then hit the repeat button to become the best version of yourself. Sean Wallace, it's an absolute pleasure to have you as our guest. Well, thank you, Miranda, for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. So this is the Dare podcast, which yes. has been launched by the Miranda Braun Diversity Leadership Foundation. And this is us having genuine conversations with top global leaders like yourselves who support the work that we're doing around diversity, inclusion and sustainability. Yeah. And it's just really learning from you, your career journey, what you were like as a child, your goals, and what advice you would give to our next generation of leaders and current leaders who are our audience today. Yeah. Thank you. So why don't we start with who you are and what you do. Yeah, uh, my name's uh, Dr. Sean Wallace. I got a, uh, an honorary doctorate from my uh, old alma mater, uh, the University of uh, North London, which was uh, the Polytechnic of North London, which I graduated from in 1983. Um, I'm a practicing barrister. I've been a practicing barrister practicing criminal defense law for the best part of 39 years now. I um, suppose I'm... I mean, 39 years. You don't look it. You can amazing. Yeah, well, thank you You're like, much. I know. <laughs> well, it's nice to say. Uh, but uh, I suppose I'm known uh, by the general public, uh, not only in England, but uh, probably around the world as the uh, dart destroyer from the ITV smash hit quiz show, The Chase. Yes, yes. No, definitely. Yeah. And you're also an author? Yes, I published uh, my book, uh, Chasing Dream, which I, uh, it's a labor of love. It took me 10 years to write. Oh, wow. Uh, and when I finally finished it in 2015, um, unfortunately, I didn't back it up on the computer and my computer crashed. Oh, no. And I sat in a darkened room for about a month, uh, you know, through a long white beard, uh, you know, and gutted that I wouldn't be able to retrieve it. And I thought to myself, well, it's point is you sort of moping about it, it's gone. And if you want people to know about your life's journey, uh, then you've got to start again, which I did. So it took me uh, two years uh, to rewrite it. And uh, I think I wrote a better version, I think. I think, well, I've I've read it and you very kindly gave me a version, this signed copy. Yeah. And I just loved it. I mean, such an interesting story. I can't wait to get stuck in and learn a bit more yeah. about you. Yeah. So tell us a bit more about your childhood. What were you like as a child? As a kid growing up, um, I was a sort of happy kid, um, very cheeky uh, uh, in class, bright. Uh, my class uh, reports used to say, sure, I'll make a very good sound. Uh, uh, but um, there was more to m that met the eye in terms of uh, the class clown because I used to love learning as a young kid. And um, I talk in my autobiography in relation to my first hero was my uh, elder sister, Sandra, who came over. Um, uh, you know, you, uh, as you realize that, uh, you know, when uh, our uh, parents came over, the eldest child always remained in the Caribbean and looked after the grandmother until they walked the festival. True. And uh, so my sister came in 64, so she became the oldest of the siblings, although she was my mum's child. I've got another sister on my dad's side, but uh, she was my first great hero, I suppose, because uh, she told me, she taught me uh, the importance of having an educated mind. So by the time I was about six or seven, I could read proficiently. Although my dad wasn't an educated man, uh, the gift he gave me was to be aware of the world around you. Mm. So I used to watch the News at 10. I remember watching the very first uh, News at 10 port, port, you know, uh, newscast in uh, 1967. Uh, so I was always aware of the world around me. Yeah. Uh, I was conscious of the fact that I was black. I was proud to be black. Good. Uh, and the fact that, so, you know, as a kid growing up, you know, everybody has role models who they look up to and aspire to. Mm. And the role models which uh, I looked up to were making uh, great strides on the world stage. Pele mm. was a World Cup winner three times. Yeah. Muhammad Ali. Oh, I, I love Muhammad Ali. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. Knew, I Still knew who Nelson Mandela was. I knew who Martin Luther King was. I remember his assassination in July 1968. Wow. Um, Malcolm X, I knew who uh, these people were. And I knew yeah. that, uh, you know, uh, they stood up for principles uh, which they uh, steadfastly believed in. Mm. And that it made me proud to be black. And as a young kid growing up, I, I used to say to myself, if I could have a fraction of what they've achieved in their life, then my life's going to mean something. Yeah. So at my home, I've got a mural on my wall called My Inspiration. So, you know, people like Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman on one side. Uh, I've actually put 
Barack Obama on there because of the uh, uh, tumultuous uh, event of him becoming the first black U.S. president yes. in my lifetime, which I've never thought I'd ever see. Yeah, Bob Marley, um, you know Jesse Owens when he defied Hitler uh, in terms of his racial, mm. um, his sort of uh, beliefs that uh, black people couldn't, uh, you know, excel in athletics, and he got four Olympic gold medals. Yeah, and the center is my two biggest inspirations: my mother and my father. I love that. You've got to give a shout out to the family. Absolutely, you have to. Yes. And where, where where did you grow up? I, I uh, grew up uh, in uh, Wembley. I've lived on the same road for the last fifty nine years. Top I, I think, well, Yes, I have, and people are astonished at that fact. Uh, you know, I'm proud of uh, the area in which I grew up. Yeah, I've seen it uh, change into a sort of predominantly white area, mm. into a vibrant, multicultural, diverse. Uh, um, um, area which I'm proud to represent and they're proud of me and what I've achieved in terms of my achievements mm. and people are astonished at the fact that I still live on the same road I grew up in and uh, my response to that is simple uh, you can only live in one nice house at one time mm. you can only drive one nice car at one time mm. you can only wear one nice suit at one time it's true so you know greed and excess has never been my watchword and uh, you know as long as you're happy and you're comfortable where you live uh, then uh, there I'm going to stay I'm a big advocate of that, having just a simple life. Yeah. It's so key. Yeah. So your career, you've got a fantastic career. How did you get started? Did did you want to be a barrister as a child? Ever since I was a kid, I wanted to be a lawyer. I used to watch programs like Crown Court and Petra Shelley and my favourite fictional hero, Ron Paul de Bailey, written one of, by one of my legal heroes at the time, John Mortimer QC. And one of the reasons why he's a hero of mine is because he was one of the top lawyers of his day. But what he demonstrated and showed to me is that he used his transferable skills um, from a barrister to becoming an author. And, you know, those transferable skills I talk about, you know, thinking in your feet, uh, the ability to research, the ability to fearless, to be fearless. And I've used those transferable skills in my own uh, uh, career uh, in the shark infested world of entertainment. Yeah. I, and I, I just love the portfolio career that you've developed for yourself, you know, from being a barrister to being a TV star, an author, you know, what? What else do you do? I'm sure there's something else that I've missed. The most important thing for me is uh, to use my fame in an altruistic way. You know, with fame comes responsibility. Just like how Peter Parker used to say in the Spider-Man movies, you know, with power comes responsibility. Yeah. I'm a firm believer of that. You know, I'm always grateful for the fact that uh, my teachers um, went out of their way to help me get to uh, realize my own dreams and ambitions to qualify mm -hmm. as a lawyer. And as I grew up, um, when I first qualified as a barrister, uh, in order to support myself through the uh, sort of uh, testing times of the fledgling career as a young barrister, mm -hmm. uh, I taught at Hackney College four nights a week for 13 years, 14 years, because I thought it was important as a blank professional to go into what was then a, a relatively uh, deprived inner city yeah. uh, to basically say to people who are prepared to actually try and educate their own minds and try and to build their own dreams and ambitions mm. uh, that you know somebody like me as a black professional who is no different uh, uh, to you in terms of uh, their growing up uh, and uh, however um, I'm here to try and help you to get to where you want to get to mm. you meet me halfway in terms of putting in the effort to working hard mm. I mean if I'm prepared to give up my evenings and not watching Crossroads is that still on? <laughs> no, no, but it was at the time. But you get the points in terms of, you know, you've got to actually make the sacrifices in order to actually get uh, the gains which you want in life. Mm, no, definitely. Um, and I just love the work that you do to give back. I mean, not only have you helped us and supported the work we're doing of the next generation of diverse leaders, but I know you do a lot to help our yes, next generation. as I say, uh, what was the point of being famous if you can't use your... I totally in, agree. Uh, an altruistic way. I always talk about uh, what I consider to be the ladder of opportunity. Uh, and I think it's important of people like me who are in the public eye who do have that uh, influence mm -hmm. to try and put that ladder of opportunity for others to actually climb up it. Yeah. But I don't want them to climb to my level. I want them to go to past me. Yeah. Because uh, my philosophy is this. If you believe in what I believe in passion, passionately in terms of using your fame to try and help others mm -hmm. for them to get their own dreams and goals, then they in turn will likewise do the same yeah. to the next generation. It's all about passing the torch of responsibility onto the next generation. Yeah. So that's what I'm about, and I'll continue to be like that until the day I die, I suppose. I love that. That's so good. Now, you call yourself a goal model. Yeah. 
Why don't you explain what that is to the... A goal model is in terms of the goals I've set for myself and have attained and have achieved, uh, as opposed to a role model whereby people sort of deify you and put you on a sort of pedestal. Uh, I'm no different than anybody else in terms of making mistakes. I've made uh, mistakes both personally and professionally. Uh, and, you know, when you are put on a uh, deified position and you do make mistakes, the fall from grace can be swift and unrelenting, especially if you are on that high pedestal. So I'm more comfortable closer to the floor. Yeah. Um, you know, on the ground. Be on the ground, yeah. yeah. Uh, and if I do sort of make mistakes, it's uh, uh, a further place, uh, less further place to fall, actually. But uh, I'm talking about people looking at the goals and achievements I've uh, attained thus far and hopefully uh, will attain further mm -hmm. as my life progresses. Uh, and I want people to be inspired by that and say, you know, if he can do it, why can't I? Definitely. You know, why not? Exactly. No. So in terms of our students mm -hmm. who will be listening to this, mm -hmm. what advice would you give them for someone who's wanting to enter either the legal um, profession or even the entertainment industry or even lecture? I, I, my key message to young students wherever I talk to them uh, is this. Um, always make sure you put your best foot forward because you never know who's watching you. Yeah. Um, you know, trying to get from A to B in terms of career progression uh, is sometimes very, very difficult. Uh, and uh, it always takes somebody uh, to notice your talent, notice what you've got, and then basically say, I'm prepared to give you that chance. Yeah. Uh, you show me anybody who's been successful in life uh, who hasn't had that helping hand by a, a person who is influential to make that difference to get them from A to B. Yeah. Uh, so I always say to uh, students, you know, always make sure you put your best foot forward because you never know who's watching you. And sometimes uh, having uh, the high class uh, um you know, qualifications is uh, no less important in relation to the character you portray mm -hmm. because sometimes people are attracted to the talent uh, uh, and your character which uh, you display mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's what will help you, as I say, um, um, be the difference between, um, you know, being well known and being uh, in obscurity, I suppose. Yeah, and also being respected. Yeah, exactly. In your profession. You know, I, 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 you know, I always use Bradley Walsh um, uh, as an example because you know I'm two days older than him, and Bradley's a dear friend of mine. Although I didn't know him before I did the chase, but he's a, a classic example uh, of a person who's worked hard, who actually sacrificed. Um, well, he, he gave up uh, his dreams of being a professional footballer because he wanted to be a comic. Now, he had to serve a hard uh, apprenticeship going in the working men's club, sometimes appearing before four men in his dog, being heckled by the dog. And, mm -hmm. and he's been a red coat, blue coat, yellow coat, you name it. Uh, but uh, the one thing he was always uh, uh, worked on was his ability, his talent um, in terms of uh, uh, his craft. Mm -hmm. And as I say, sometimes you, uh, if you do put your best foot forward, you never know who's watching you. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, on uh, one occasion, uh, he was spotted by an influential ITV executive who basically gave him a chance. And I always say to uh, people, when you do get a chance, when you leap from the chorus line to lead singer, mm. make sure you can sing. Because if you can't, mm. there's somebody waiting in the wings who can. Mm. So, you know, you do need, um, you know, certain characteristics in terms of, uh, you know, being perseverance, you know, perseverance mm. resilient, determined. The, the, those are important factors because, you know, the one thing uh, you will get uh, in life when you are trying to make that career procession, uh, progression is that you are going to get setbacks. It took me uh, the best part of nearly three to four years to actually find a tenancy, and it was very, very difficult. And sometimes, you know, people don't uh, realize the sort of uh, mental trauma and the mental uh, difficulties that can have on your confidence. And uh, I think it's always important to recognize that when people uh, have been rejected uh, and to, you know, take uh, proper care in relation to uh, the fact that, uh, you know, uh, mental fragility sometimes is really, really uh, crucial to make sure that uh, we need to support um, the talent we're there. It's funny because we had a conversation with Chizzy and we were talking about mental health and well-being and how that's so important, especially it's something that's not really discussed much within the black and Asian community. Yeah. I think especially when you look at men, yeah. men are more likely to suffer and have higher suicide rates. So I think it's something that needs to be addressed. It is because as I say sometimes, you know, it, you know, that sometimes always seems to be as a taboo subject. And as I say, mm -hmm. there's sort of the male machismo in terms of, you know, I can cope, I can deal with it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, when it becomes overwhelming, um, it can sort of engulf you. 
and act like an avalanche uh, in life. So I think it's always important that we do recognize and uh, try to be uh, more aware mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, mental health and mental well-being, because that's just as important uh, in relation to, uh, you know, people, you know, trying to get on in life, I suppose. Definitely. And, and, how, and how did you get through it? Well, uh, one of the reasons I wrote uh, the autobiography is because of the fact that, uh, you know, when people see me now, they think I was born rich, they think I was born clever, they think I was born famous. And there is a backstory. Uh, you know, one of the first uh, uh, um, points I made in my book when my mum held me uh, in her arms, I was born on Thursday, the 2nd of June, 1960. Thursday's child has far to go. So it does describe the sort of up and down nature of the sort of uh, downs and ups which I've had in my life up to date. And when I set my exams, uh, you know, I was like an 11-year-old kid, uh, like Muhammad Ali. I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm going to be the greatest. But if you talk to talk, you've got to be able to walk the walk. 100%. And I remember 43 years ago when I didn't pass the A-levels uh, to the requisite grades in order to get me into university. Mm. It was devastating. And I talked about it last week when I was on Good Morning Britain. I just burst you know, into tears. Mm. Uh, because for me, there was no plan B. Mm. Uh, it was a lawyer or a lawyer. Mm. I, I didn't envisage anything else. Mm. And, you know, you always uh, sometimes, you know, point a finger of blame in relation to when you don't actually make uh, the academic grade. It was his fault, it was her fault. I didn't get the support. But the first person you've got to look at is a reflection in the mirror. Mm. You've got to ask yourself those searching questions. You know, did I work hard enough? Was I good mm. enough? Uh, can I do it? Uh, and, uh, you know, no man is an island. Obviously, if you do have the talent, uh, talent in its own, um, does need a necessarily requisite support. Mm -hmm. And I had that in terms of uh, my parents who were always very, very supportive of my dreams and ambitions. Mm -hmm. uh, the other school uh, which I left uh, uh, to join, Elster High School, which uh, was a school which actually championed um, and pro you know, really promoted uh, irrespective of your uh, gender, color, race, disability of those dreams or ambitions. So I was really, really grateful to them uh, for the support I got from them. And eventually I managed to pass those exams. And um, you know, when I got called to the bar in November uh, 1984, it was the best day of my life, I bet. as still is to date, yeah. because I taught the talk and I walked the walk. Yeah. But when I came off that academic uh, conveyor belt and uh, received that certificate, even amongst all the um, celebrations at the time of me being a, a finely qualified, albeit fledgling young barrister, the first thing which struck me at, moment, at that moment in time was this. All the hard work, all you've done was bring me to the start line of a different challenge. Mm -hmm. And that's all what success does. Mm -hmm. You can never, ever rest on your morals. So that's another uh, important message I say to students uh, going through their academic journey or students who have basically got their degree uh, and now uh, feel like they've got the world in their feet and they're meeting a different challenge now. You're going into the world of work. It's going to be very, very competitive, highly competitive. And that's why I say in relation to the fact that uh, um, how are you going to be that standout candidate against your competitive or rival? You know, that's why I always say, put yourself in a positive light because you never know who's watching you. Yeah, and this is such good advice because one of the things we do at the charity is bridge that gap between the education and getting your first job. Yeah. Because there, there is a large gap. It is, and, so and sometimes... to get this advice. Yeah, and sometimes that gap uh, may at times seem insurmountable, insurmountable yeah. especially when you get... Uh, rejection after rejection mm -hmm. and you know sometimes what you do find is that uh, you know um, the depths of despair of being rejected uh, can be uh, too much for some students sure. uh, and uh, I don't want to sound glib uh, but that's why uh, the characteristics of perseverance fortitude determination and courage mm -hmm. will stand you in good stead mm -hmm. um, so you know you, no. you've always got to have self-belief because uh, mm -hmm. one thing I always say to young students is this Tomorrow's not promised to anybody, mm. but you know, uh, you got to believe that the future belongs to you. Mm. Uh, and I always say to students, uh, you know, sometimes as young as six, I could be talking to the next prime minister. I could mm. be talking to the person who finally discovers a cure for cancer. I could be talking to the person who finally lifts the World Cup for England, male or female. Ask yourself this question, why can't it be you? So it's always important that uh, people in our position um, always nurture uh, and encourage uh, uh, the uh, dreams should be uh, unlimited and uh, without, um, you know, boundary. I, I, I totally agree with that. And that's one of the things we do. We go to schools and we start from three, four years old. And, we, you know, one of the questions we asked years ago was, 
How many of you think the role of a lawyer or a judge is a man's job? They all put their hand up. What about a woman's job? Hardly any put their hand up. And these were like very young children yeah. who did not comprehend that a woman could actually perform these roles. And, you know, it just goes to show that uh, talent is colorblind. Uh, it's gender blind. Um, and uh, that's why it's important to look to uh, those names which I've mentioned um, as being the goal stroke role models that we should attain and aspire to. Because I remember when I first met Gary and uh, when he had his silks party, he mentioned the same thing. Uh, you know, I saw him in the corner at um, the Old Bailey in 1999. Um, and I thought it was important as a seasoned, relatively seasoned young black lawyer for me to go up to him to introduce myself, to basically, you know, let him know that so you know, you're not alone. You see somebody with the same color skin as you. And the same thing was done to me by Courtney Griffiths, KC. Oh, I know Courtney Cook. Yeah, it's, it's a small world. Everyone knows. Yeah, everybody knows everybody. So, you know, it, it's important, especially um, in ethnic minorities and black people in particular, mm -hmm. uh, for us to actually um, put that ladder of opportunity uh, for people of the same color skin as you yeah, to come. Definitely. Now, I also love the fact that one of the TV work that you did was Caribbean DNA. Yeah. So you actually went back to the Caribbean, yeah. checked out your DNA. Yeah links to slavery, yeah. um, you know, and you mentioned racism. I would love to, I mean, what was that like going back to the Caribbean? And I, I suppose, you know, being in the public eye and working for ITV has its advantages. And one of those advantages is that obviously, you know, when people do their sort of ancestry, DNA, UK, you know, there's, there's a limit to how far you can go back. Well, mm -hmm. the, you know, I had the benefit of having the resources where um, rarely, um, and it was really rare in my case that we could actually trace my uh, ancestry on my mother's side going back to 1730s mm. uh, where, you know, my, and I remember seeing my uh, great, great grandmother six times removed. Her name was the last entry uh, in the slaves register. Wow. Uh, and uh, it must have been horrible and terrible for her. Mm. Uh, but to survive that and to have actually, you know, managed to produce a line which you know has uh, remained unbroken for the best part of nearly three centuries, mm -hmm. uh, was a source of pride. Yeah. And uh, I had commissioned um, a drawing of all my six great grandmothers in that line, uh, you know, as I would imagine them in my head. Yeah. Uh, and you know that takes a pride of place on my ward as well. So, you know, I'm sure they're looking down my ancestors uh, on my mum's side, you know, looking down with a source of pride in relation to the fact that uh, you know their little grandson is trying to make waves, I suppose. You're trying, you definitely are. Well, There's trying. no trying about no, it. Trying. You're definitely making waves. I love that. And you're clearly ambitious. You're yes. clearly driven. Even now. Where does that come from? Uh, I suppose, um, going back to the point I made, uh, you know, seeing uh, those black heroes, those black role models, yeah. uh, who were at the very top of their game. Yeah. Uh, and as I said to you before, you, the minute you start to rest on your laurels, the minute you think that you are a success, that's when you're on the way down. Yeah. So for me, it's always about setting goals and challenges. I mean, I'm, I was 63 this year, uh, and uh, I hope to actually uh, continue to set goals for myself that people can look to and basically say, well, I want to be like him. Yeah. And uh, my response to them, yeah, it's nice that you want to be like me, but I want you to be a better version of me. I love that. Because for me, it's, uh, you know, once I shuffle off this morning coil, uh, the greatest compliment I want to leave for myself, the legacy that the name Sean Wallace stand for that yeah that's what it's about for me yeah definitely so you've been on the chaser as you've mentioned yeah the world's first chaser yeah but you also mentioned you won mastermind in 2004 yeah, in, two, in 2004 yeah i was the first black person to apply in the show's 36 year history up to that point point. and you still are the only black person to, to have won, won mastermind, mastermind yeah and which uh, is insane in well uh, hopefully well you know hopefully i won't be the last you know you do need a bit of luck yeah um, you know, obviously you've got to put the hard work in. You've got, you, you've got to have the ability to answer questions. And, mm -hmm. you know, no matter how successful you are in life, you know, I've always said this, it's 1% um, talent, 99% luck, but you made that 1% talent go a long way. Yeah. So, you know, I was very, very grateful and fortunate. Uh, you know, it changed my life, um, but it didn't change me as a person. That's why, as I say, I've still lived on the same yeah. life for the last 59 years. Look at Warren Buffett. He's still living in the same house. Exactly. And he's a billionaire, yeah. so he does the show. Yeah. So um, how did you make the transition? How did you get the opportunity for anyone that might be in a professional career and they might be thinking, actually, I fancy doing a bit of TV work as well. How did you make that transition? 
it was hard. You know, as I say, it's being at the, sometimes it's being at the right. I, I don't want to sound negative um, mm-hmm. because you know it is ninety nine percent luck, uh, and you make your talent um, go that uh, extra further. Yeah. Uh, and as I say, being in the right place at the right time for me. Um, I had no dreams or ambitions of wanting to be a TV star. I just mm-hmm. wanted to be a quizzer answering questions on a quiz show. And I, the reason why I was so successful and I used to appear on a lot of uh, uh, game shows in the early noughties is because of the fact that I was black, because you never saw black contestants. Mm. Uh, and most of the uh, game show producers were uh, basically uh, enamored with my intellect. And sometimes I didn't even have to apply uh, to go on quiz shows. They used to basically invite me. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I've always, there's always a mantra which I always say, procrastination is the thief of time. Mm. And uh, I always told everybody in the late 80s I wanted to do Mastermind because I watched the very first show uh, when it was on its graveyard slot in September 1972. And I was fascinated how people could actually put themselves through uh, the ordeal of sitting in a back chair with a bright light shining in your face, mm. asked questions by an intimidated question master, mm. uh, by, uh, you know, with the watching studio audience with millions uh, of people watching your performance from the comfort of the sofa. Mm. And it's easy answering questions on the sofa. It is so easy. Yeah, um, see how good I was. Um, yeah. And um, I never ever, uh, if you were to ask the um, uh, 11 year old Sean Wallace, apart from your dreams of being a lawyer, that you are going to be the first black mastermind champion, he probably would tell you you're lying. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, I wouldn't swap uh, what's happened to me for a million years. Uh, I wouldn't change um, the way in which my life has developed thus far because, as I say, I have made mistakes, both mm-hmm. professionally and personally. Mm. Uh, and I suppose if you don't learn from your mistakes, you never will. Mm. So I am grateful for what's happened to me. Um, I'm very, very conscious of the fact that I'm today's news, I'm tomorrow's chip prepper. Mm. So I don't take that for granted. Yeah. Uh, and especially on the chase, I'm only as good as the last question I answered correctly. Mm. And as a barrister, I'm only as good as my last closing speech. So it means I don't take that talent for granted. No. And I want to discuss racism for a bit. Have you experienced racism throughout your career? Not overtly. No. Uh, I always tell this story uh, because uh, uh, 40 to 50 years ago, educational standards had a low expectation of people of colour. Mm. I know that what you achieved in Life Miranda is fantastic, but... Uh, uh, if you were growing up 40 to 50 years ago, they'd expect you to either be working in a typing pool mm-hmm. or living in a high-rise council flat with loads of children running around your ankles with no visible mm-hmm. means of a man to support you. Mm-hmm. And if you're a black uh, boy growing up, they expect you to either be a bus driver or a mechanic or uh, sadly be engaged in the criminal justice system mm-hmm. in relation to the latter uh, prophecy, what's changed. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I remember when I brought, because uh, uh, I wrote to the bar council when I was 12 years old and they told me what I needed to achieve to be a lawyer to be a lawyer. And when I handed that to my career teacher, because you know you got to go through yeah. that to write a passage, yeah. and I remember she turned around and said in a rather cold and dismissive manner, you, a lawyer, at best you're going to end up working in a factory, but somebody like you is going to end up definitely in prison. I mean, she was right about me ending up in prison. And she got to say that after I haven't seen my client, I can go home again. But to be told that uh, as an 11 year old, 12, 15 year old kid, that your life's going to uh, end up nothing more than being in a relatively menial dead-end job uh, or uh, sadly being engaged in a criminal justice system. But even at the age of 15, I was determined to ensure that nobody was going to control my destiny. Good. But the only way I could ensure that was to make sure I had an educated mind. And I, I think that's key. But I think when we look at our next generation, it's great that we've got charities like mine, you know, doing the work. We've got lovely leaders like yourself giving back, lecturing, mentoring, supporting our next generation but I think we've also got to look at the educational system we've got to look at the teachers because the amount of students I've mentored over the years or when I give talks and they come to me in tears saying my I want to be a lawyer I want to be x or y and my teacher has told me I can't do it and they actually believe their teacher and it takes a lot of work to undo that yeah whereas if the teachers are supportive like one of the things you said earlier on in the podcast is how you would be cheeky and mess around and you know they would call you clown or they'd they'd was, was it a nickname or something? Yeah, sure, we'll make a clown in the class. But, but I think uh, there was this thing where, as well, with black boys, they would label them a clown or label them disruptive or put them in the yeah. lower class or yeah. the special school. Yeah. So I think we've got to be really careful. And it's a known fact with research that young black 
boys are more likely to be excluded or suspended. Absolutely, absolutely. So we've got to look at the educational system. It isn't just a case of doing all this wonderful work, let's mentor, let's, you know, inspire our next generation. We've got to look at how are things being done within the schools. And, and yeah, uh, that, that's quite clear. And uh, as I say, it's, it's got to be a level playing field in relation to uh, the dreams and aspirations that uh, uh, teachers um, try to inspire in their children. They have a duty of care, not only to teach, but I think a duty of care to inspire. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, just because a kid may be disruptive uh, and maybe from a particular ethnic or social background, it doesn't mean to say that they should be written off totally. 100%. Um, so, you know, I, I suppose that's why I like going into schools and colleges and even prisons. Yeah. Uh, and the reason why I go into prisons is because although prisoners are uh, seen as, uh, you know, the forgotten minority and uh, they're there for a reason you know the one thing i do say to them is this that you may have a lot in your landscape but it doesn't mean to say that um you know you're finished into because i could point to numerous examples in history both past and present of people who have been incarcerated but still nevertheless have come out to make something of themselves mm -hmm. and have reintegrated into society in a very successful way yeah and also let's let's remind ourselves that there are some prisoners who are innocent yes of and they're wrongly convicted of so course. not everyone that's in there is guilty of course. um the case in point in relation to uh you know the, uh, the man who was wrongly convicted of rape and uh um quite rightly uh refused to actually accept a pardon uh mm -hmm. because he knew he was innocent mm -hmm. and that you know the dedicated work from his legal team um eventually uh saw justice albeit 17 years late to be mm -hmm. done I know. So, I did some research on you. Okay. 2,100 sit-ups every day. Yeah. Do you still do that? Yes, I, I get up uh, and train every single morning because when you get to my age, I think it's important that uh, one of the reasons I train, um, and I'm not saying everybody should uh, do it to the sort of levels I do it. I think mm -hmm. everybody has a duty and responsibility to look after their own health. Yeah. And I want to be, by the time I'm 70, 80, probably 90, who knows, I may uh, hit the three figures. But I want to try and be. King. I try. I want to be uh, as uh, physically uh, independent as I possibly can, uh, and I think if people do take uh, um, uh, an important um, role in their, you know, their own health and well-being, uh, in terms of, I'm not saying that uh, you know you've got to do what I do, but you know walking down the road, eating yeah. uh, um, healthily. Yeah. Um, not only will you be doing yourself a great service, you'll be also helping the NHS, which obviously is under a considerable strain. Yes. Uh, so I, I think everybody has a duty to actually try and look after themselves. No, definitely. And I'm I'm really passionate about that. That's actually what this year's annual lecture is yeah. with the charity. It's been hosted by Hogan Lovells and it's called um, Addressing ESG plus the H, the health inequalities. I think it's so important that we address that. And I'm glad that you've mentioned the importance of not just working on your career but also the importance of maintaining your health because your health is your wealth. yes exactly. and without your health you can't, can't do anything. any further so uh -huh. it's really important that you do eat correctly you are active you do move around mm -hmm. how long does it take you to do 21,000 not 21,000 sit ups uh, normally about half an hour so I, I do I, I do it in batches of 100 yeah uh, then uh, every morning I normally get up because uh, we've got an outdoor gym and irrespective of the weather, um, you will go in there. I'll go, yeah, because I always say to people, the worst thought about training is the thought of doing it. Yes, once you get in there, yeah. so they say. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. So now I also was at Oxford University, as you know. You came to the last year's lecture, and it was on bordering sustainability and inclusion. What tips do you think in the entertainment industry, but also in the legal industry? What do you think we should be doing to make it more diverse and more inclusive well, and sustainable uh, as well? Well, uh, uh, you know, you know the concept of allyship. You know, uh, you know, people who are in positions of power and authority uh, will never know what it's like to have suffered racism. Mm. Uh, what they need to do is to be, uh, you know, to have that concept of allyship uh, to actually understand um, uh, and to have a genuine understanding and uh, generally want to actually do something about. Uh, the glaring inequalities which still exist, for example, when you look at the top of the boardroom. Mm. Uh, Sharon White is the only uh, black female CEO I can think who uh, runs John Lewis. Yeah. Uh, you know, that uh, the sort of um, report which basically said 1% of uh, uh, most of the magic um, 
five uh, top law firms only have for you know black lawyers mm. who, who are partners so i think it's a concept of uh, you know uh, allyship uh, a concept of uh, you know of the powers that be um um having um a proper dialogue in relation to if they want to uh, have uh, a real change in terms of having a board uh, which is talented, which need, you know I, I don't believe in the so-called Rooney rule that you should promote somebody because of their colour. You've got to have the actually ability uh, and talent to do so, because if you promote somebody, uh, uh, what we call the Peter principle, uh, uh, beyond their competence. Uh, and they're black or from an ethnic minority, it then lends credence to uh, the detractors of basically say, look, see, I told you so. Mm. So, you know, it's, it's all about having the ability to do so. Uh, but uh, there's got to be a, a sensible uh, dialogue because one thing, uh, when you look in a diverse society, um, a diverse society uh, uh, wants to um, um, go to services with people who look and sound like them. Mm. And I think uh, that most businesses uh, and, uh, as I say, law, you know, the legal profession, uh, as I say, is alive to the fact that, uh, as I've already alluded to, you are seeing uh, a great more um, um, ethnic minority QCs. Uh, with, there's still a um, criminally low underrepresentation of the judiciary. But as I say, uh, you know, when I uh, was coming to the bar 39 years ago, you know, the, uh, the mere notion of having black silks mm. uh, uh, was seen as an anathema, mm. let alone as a black judge. So, you know, there are strides being made, but as I say, um, it's never enough and it never can be enough. Yeah. So I, I think it's a question of, you know, um, the concept of allyship in terms of, um, you know, uh, the powers that be, um, um, you know, I wouldn't say stepping into the shoes, but, but to, you know, recognizing the fact that, um, you know, there is talent coming through, there is talent irrespective of your gender diversity or sexuality coming through, mm-hmm. uh, and eventually um, uh, that must be recognized. Yeah, definitely. So you have achieved so much. I've still got a lot to go. That's exactly it. So that's the next question. What is next for you, Sean? Um, I, I still want to... Um, try and be successful not only in my legal career and hopefully in the field of entertainment who knows where that's going to lead um, as i say i was very very fortunate last week uh, to be given an opportunity to be a guest panelist on good morning britain so it just goes to show that uh, you know there was recognition that uh, there's more to me than just being a quizzer yeah and it's important that i show that dexterity in terms of being able to do other things yeah uh, in the field of entertainment uh, as a lawyer, I'm still ambitious enough, uh, although, as I say, I'm knocking on a bit in terms of age, I still want to try and get to the top of uh, that greasy pole that is a legal profession. Mm. Um, so, you know, I've I, I still got a lot to do. But more importantly, as I said to you before, it's about using my fame in an altruistic way um, because I want the name of Sean Wallace to mean something during the ages. Yeah, and I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will. So our last question. So the podcast is called Dare, D-A-R-E. The D stands for having the determination, the A is for having the action, the R is the realistic assessment and the resilience, and the E is having the enthusiasm and the positive energy to make your dreams come true. Yeah. One of the things I say is dare to dream big. Yes. What would you dare our audience to do in order to achieve their goals? Um, I, I don't think I would be uh, straight far from that. Um, I, I would always say have that self-belief um, and never ever be uh, let anybody tell you that you cannot achieve because you can. Yeah. Uh, and as I say, uh, people like me are the guardians of today. And I always say to young people, you are the future of tomorrow. Yeah. I love that. And think about it. Yes. Sean Wallace, thank you so much. You've been a wonderful guest. Thank you. Thank you very Cheers. much. Thank you. Cheers. And look forward to hearing this. And this is going to be on all the usual podcast platforms, including YouTube. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. <laughs>